Thank you very much. Um, in fact, actually, I'm here under a different guise. So while I um, do sit with our human resources practice group, what I actually specialise in, specialise in is education. Um, so this is looking at not at anything to do with HR, because I don't think any HR will be... Well, it's obviously fundamentally important to the offer that you can make to students, because if you haven't got the people to deliver what you're offering your students, um, it doesn't really work. But actually, what I'm going to talk about today is um, the legal framework for making offers to students. Um, and the reason I'm going to talk about that is because um, as you're being asked to make more interesting offers to students and to provide, as, as was highlighted a moment ago, that great focus there is on data, so more data for students, there is a real requirement from the law that you actually deliver what you promise. So it's really quite important that you understand the framework and environment in which you're operating and make sure that the framework that you put in place and the documentation that you give to students actually supports what you're giving to them. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going to do my very best to make it not as dull as it might be, because I, I have to say, um, consumer law, not the most exciting area of law in the world. There are much more exciting ones. Um, but but I, I do think it's fundamentally important that you understand what you're required to do um, and, and what the, uh, the problems might be if you don't get it quite right. So, oh, if I press the right button. Right, um, this is a starting point. Um, of course, you know, uh, and, and we've been talking about this for, for years now, um, that the relationship between students and the university is contractual. Um, and students are consumers. Um, and whether we might want to have a lovely debate about whether they are learning partners and the pedagogical value of going to university, as a matter of law, they are consumers. So they are a benefit from the consumer framework, consumer law framework. So exactly the same framework that applies when you go and buy a tin of beans or call in a plumber applies to the delivery of, of um, services within the university. And it doesn't fit that happily because it's a very different sort of service, but nevertheless the rules apply to you. So it's worth understanding what they are because I think it has to inform the way in which you make offers to students. Um, and what's particularly important when we're talking about the use of social media um, is the impact of pre-contract statements and promises on your contract. Because what consumer law says effectively is if you've promised something before they've entered into the contract, you've got to deliver it. That's part of the contract. So if you have lots of people advocating for you as institutions, and saying what a great time people are going to have there. You just have to be really careful about the basis on which that advocacy is carried out and make sure that those individuals are speaking about their experience and providing personal views and not representing and making representations on, on behalf of the institution. So great to have these advocates. And I love, you know, open days. My, my son's in the first year at university so we did lots of open days and you walk around with students and they tell you all kinds of fantastic things about what's going to happen when you get to university and arguably because they're representing the university we could rely on them in making our decision and expect that what they've told us is going to happen so it, there is a need to be careful um, I just thought it was worth bearing in mind that consumer law is not the whole framework um, it, it is, is part of it there's a very uh, important relationship of fairness and transparency between universities and their students. They've got to understand what they're getting, what they're delivering, um, particularly transparency around free fees. They've got to understand what they're paying. It's not only the base cost, but if they're going to go on placement, do they have to pay for that? Do they have to pay for equipment? Um, do they have to pay for other experiences that they're, they're going to have at university? They need to know up front when they're making the decision about whether or not to come on a course. So it's all part of the offer that you need to put forward. Um, we have various other, other rules around natural justice, so that's people knowing what, what you're going to do and giving an opportunity to respond to it before decisions are made, um, understanding their right to privacy, making sure that that's um, properly and appropriately uh, considered within the, the offers that you make, um, and your management of data. When the General Data Protection Regulation comes into force, um, the rules around data will become much more complicated and everybody within the institution who is dealing with student data will need to understand what it is um, and how to manage that data effectively. Um, both the QAA Quality Code and the Hefke Good Practice Guide um, 
set a framework for the way in which you should be communicating with students and the sort of information that you should be giving. Um, and again, where you're looking at your offers to students, you need to understand what those regulations say because you need to be complying with them. And of course, the, the, the ultimate complaint for students and the place where we see most student complaints going now is the um, Office of the Independent Adjudicator. And we get every year we get that sort of exponential growth in the number of uh, student complaints, although there was one year where they went down, but only very slightly, and then it all recovered back to high levels in the following year. We don't see so many um, court claims arising, arising from, from student contracts. They mostly go to the OIA because usually the OIA will give satisfaction. But it depends how much they're looking for. So what levels of compensation would they expect if they haven't quite got what you promised them in their offer? Um, OIA um, compensation levels are going up. Um, but depending on what people are looking for, so I, I've been dealing with a further education college case where the mother was claiming that the student had lost his opportunity to pursue his desired career. And she was looking for compensation on that basis. Calculated on the most bizarre basis, and she, she went away after a while. But nevertheless, um, it's quite interesting, the, the approaches that are being taken. So just a very quick skip through the rather exciting consumer framework. Um, consumer law, not new. It, the, the current law is just a consolidation of what was there before. Um, and those are the sets of regulations. Um, and just the key things to take from the regulations, uh, the various sets of regulations. Um, there is an obligation to provide pre-contract information, that is clear, and covers all the elements of what you're offering. So you're entering into a contract, the elements of the contract have to include what, it, what it's going to cost, what service you're going to deliver, what other elements are you offering. So it's not only the educational services, what about pastoral support? How much support is there going to be? Um, what are you offering in, in, in terms of um, extracurricular activity? So all of those elements need to be communicated beforehand, but what you communicate is what you then have to deliver. And if you want to change things, and you think you, need, you might need to change matters, you'll need to be very, very clear about the changes that are likely to happen. And if they change after the student has entered into the contract, then you may well need student consent to make the changes. So you do need to think very carefully about what you're offering and how you put that offer to them. Um, and we'll look at rights of cancellation in a few moments. Um, how am I doing? Oh, right, okay. Okay, um, so the, again, can she, the, um, the protection from um, trading regulations um, just set out the requirements of the information that students ought to have in advance. So again, it's, it's more what goes into your offer. There's an awful lot of detail in the regulations about the sort of information that students need to have or anybody buying goods and services needs to have to be able to understand what it is that they're buying in advance. Um, you can't mislead them and if you make misleading or aggressive statements then potentially there's a criminal offence there. Um, so again if you've got people marketing on your behalf particularly if you're thinking about international marketing how are you controlling and managing the way in which um, agents might be um, marketing your institution, you do need to know what they're doing on your behalf. Um, this just confirms that, that the, um, the, the Consumer Rights Act, which is the, the, the base piece of legislation, is really just a consolidation of what was there before, with a bit of um, EU law on top of it. Um, those are the key changes. So your pre-contractual information will form part of the contract. It doesn't matter whether it's oral or written. Representations that you make that people rely on and entering into a contract form part of its terms. So what representations are being made on your behalf and by whom? Because that's, that'll be your contract with the student, now your offer that you're going to make that they're going to accept. So um, there are statutory remedies. Statutory remedies are generally, and we were talking about this a moment ago, um, what, what remedies do students, students want when things go wrong? Um, in general, they want another opportunity to improve their mark, resit the exam if they've failed. The statutory remedies um, under the Consumer Rights Act are a right to have the service repeated. So if the student says, you didn't deliver what you told me you were going to deliver in your offer, their right, the statutory remedy is to, to repeat it, so to have the service again. Um, or um, if, if you can't re-deliver re the service, then um, a right to, to compensation or a price reduction. So 
So again, can they have some of their fees back if you didn't quite give them what you said you would? So making sure that you know what you're offering and that you're delivering against it is very important. Um, there are various things that can't be excluded, which are a bit broader than they used to be under the um, old rules, but I won't dwell on what those are. Um, just what, all I wanted to highlight on this slide is just the, the, um, what an unfair term is. So an unfair term is something that causes a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations under the contract to the detriment of the consumer. So where that's particularly important for institutions is where your contracts and your offer to the student includes a right to cancel courses, change courses, um, change where uh, courses are delivered. So all of those things that give you control over um, and the right to vary um, what you'd offer to students in the first place are quite likely to be unfair um, where it doesn't give the student what you originally promised them. Um, and usually if you're going to make those sort of changes then you will need to um, provide a right of cancellation uh, or withdraw uh, at no penalty for the student. Um, so just some practical points. When's the contract formed? Generally once the, um, the offer is made and accepted that will be the, the, the formation of the contract. And there's been an argument about whether there's a later contract on, on enrolment, but actually I think really what you've got a contract in place once you've made an offer that's been accepted by the student. Um, the offer needs contains very specific information about what the course is, um, and it will include any information that you've put into the public domain and, and students have relied on in, in uh, deciding to accept the programme. Um, if you're going to have conditions, then you need to make sure that those are clearly set out. Um, and you need, because if you, anything you haven't told the student in advance of them accepting the contract won't be incorporated. So it won't form part of the contract. So all those material things that you want to form part of the offer, not only the great things that you want them to rely on in, coming, in choosing your institution, but everything needs to be uh, put on the table in, in advance so it's incorporated into the contract. Um, there will need to be a right of cancellation. There's an interesting debate. Usually cancellation is two weeks from when the contract's formed, i.e. two weeks after they accept their offer. But in practice, most institutions will accept cancellation um, at the point of enrolment as well. So students do withdraw later. And there is an interesting for today, obviously, um, about whether actually if you're, they're cancelling at this late, that later stage, you can still require them to pay the fees because, of course, it's not complying with statutory cancellation. Most institutions allow later cance cancellation. Um, think about your services in your offer, not just education, it's all those other things as well, like pastoral services. Um, and, the, uh, and also think about it in relation to students with disabilities. So where you're saying, well, we've got great social life at our institution, you need to think about making sure that that's accessible to all students. Because, uh, again, you won't quite be delivering what you've promised if um, a student with uh, disabilities couldn't access, um, the, say, access the bar. An interesting um, lady who was a wheelchair user who said, well, at my institution it was very easy to get into the bar. That was perfectly accessible. But all the bars were so high, I couldn't go to the, the, the bar, up to the bar myself and actually order a drink because I was just too small <coughs> in my wheelchair. And she was a very small lady anyway. So uh, those sort of things in terms of your offer and what you're offering students need to be thought about. Um, you need to be very clear, clear about fees and making sure that people know whether they're going to be increases, whether there's anything additional to pay. Um, think about your variation clauses. That they are, the, the, your ability to vary is quite restricted under the consumer regulations. Um, again, with disc, disclaimers, things that say um, we can't deliver that if these particular things happen. Force majeure is just a, an element of a disclaimer. Um, you need to think about what, what, what you're including there, but you need to make people aware. So that this is part of your offer because it's incorporated um, and, and consumer regulations require people to know in advance what they're getting into. Um, if you're introducing new terms and conditions, again, you'll generally need consent um, and you need to have clear termination provisions and students need to know what the termination provisions are when they come in as part of your offer. Right, there we are. sorry, I did that at very high speed, um, but I just wanted to make sure that there was at least a little bit of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you.